morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Um, I want to welcome any visitors we have here this morning. Uh, we do have a registry in the back where the doors are. If you would please sign it, let us know who you are. We'd like to reach out to you and say hi. Um, I want to wish a happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. We wouldn't be here without you. <laughs> Literally. Um, this, this Tuesday we will be starting to lay the new carpet. So uh, this is the last Sunday that the old green carpet will be in. Um, we should be done with it on Friday. So uh, it will be a big change when you come in next week. Um, next Sunday we will have our council meeting for you council members. It is not today. It will be next Sunday. We also have a sign-up sheet in the back for our workshop. That's the Bible study for the direction that we want to go with the church. I really want to see as many people as possible. We'll be held on Saturday. I know I sent out notices to everybody. Um, and we will be providing lunch. So um, that will hopefully get you all here. Um, the last thing I want to talk to you a little bit about is we have our auto system set up where you can do your tithing online. Um, it is a really simple system to use, but Wendy wanted me to let you know, anyone that wants to do it that maybe not, not real good on the computer or wants her to help you walk through it, she would stay after church on, on any Sunday that she's here to see her and she can get you signed up for that. I signed up for it, and the really nice thing about it is, you put it in your budget, and even if you miss a Sunday, it's, you're still giving your title. So it helps the church out in budgeting, because we know that that amount is going to be coming in, and it's a, it's a great system to have. So I would welcome anybody that wants to use it, to use it. Are there any other problems? If not, now let us prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prelude, and thank you, Jim, for writing the camera. Thank you.
Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful, just, will forgive our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are bondage to sin and cannot pray ourselves. We have sinned against you, God, word and deed, by all we have done, and by all we have done undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake, forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
they found his precious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God. No. 
John, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. I have said these things to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another, as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask Him in my name. I am giving you these commandments so that you may love one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Author Phil Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, shares this little story. He writes, Not long ago I received in the mail a postcard from a friend that had on it only six words. I am the one Jesus loves. I smiled when I saw the return address, for my strange friend excels in that kind of pious slogans. When I called him, though, he told me the slogan came from the author and speaker, Brennan Manning. At a seminar, Manning referred to Jesus' closest friend on earth, the disciple named John, identified in the gospel as the one Jesus loves. Manning said, if John were to be asked, what is your primary identity in life? He would not reply, I am a disciple, an apostle, an evangelist, an author of one of the four Gospels. But rather, I am the one Jesus loves. What would it mean if you and I came to the place where we as individuals saw our primary identity in life as the one Jesus loves? How differently would I view myself at the end of the day? Sociologists have a, a theory called the looking glass self. You become what the most important person in your life, could be a spouse, father, mother, grandparent, and so on, thinks you are. How would my life change if I truly believe that I am the one Jesus loves? And if I looked in the mirror and saw what God sees? There are profound implications to being loved the way we are loved by God. We are called by Jesus to abide in His love for us. For us, it is the spiritual equivalent of 9-11. Life can never be the same again. There's no going back to what used to be. Just as the terrorism, the tactic of Orthodox Islam has changed the course of our, natural, our, our national history and perceptions, so Jesus' love for us has changed the course of our spiritual destiny. We cannot go back because what was no longer exists. Our second lesson in 1 John 5, I think, is a really a marvelous commentary on the gospel text we have before us this morning. I'm going to read it, and I've got a couple of comments interwoven here. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. So, being born from above, anything of God, and loving God, we also love the Son of God and all therefore who bear his name. The author goes on. By this we know that we, we love the children of God when we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. And this is the victory that conquers the world. Our faith. Who is it that conquers the world? But the one who believes in Jesus, the Son of God. 
This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not water only, but with water and the blood. So think of this birth, the breaking of the water, and its analogy in baptism, sign and symbol of the Father's Amen, and then the cross, the blood of the new covenant shed for us. says, and the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is true. This love of Jesus in our lives is really a two-way street, you know. Yes, we are well aware that our Lord chose us and that we did not choose Him. Literally, this was true of Jesus and his disciples. Normally, a young man, if they wanted to become a rabbi, somewhere around age 30 they had to be. And they would go off and seek a rabbi and ask that rabbi, will you take me on to be your student? And the rabbi will either say, no, not you, or yes, I'll take you on. But Jesus chose his disciples. It didn't happen in the normal way for them. Jesus came to them and said, follow me. And on their part, they followed Jesus. And Jesus therefore took responsibility for their well-being and their theological education and in their spiritual growth to become like him. And as Luther noted, to become little Christs. The initiative resides with the Lord. And because he chose us, as he chose the twelve, he also makes us a part of Himself. That is, He calls us into the relationship He shares with His Father. Namely, that as Jesus keeps His Father's commandments, which we witness in His laying down His life for us, so we are to keep Jesus' commandment, which is to love one another as Jesus has loved us. Just as Jesus' obedience to His Father's command is His witness to the world of His love for the Father. So our obedience to Jesus' command is our witness to the world of our love for Jesus. But make no mistake, Jesus is not some kind of milk toast, kind of Messiah. When He commanded the disciples to love each other as He loved them, He wasn't just speaking of familiar, familial or, or brotherly kind of love but rather a love that does what is best for the other, despite what pain it might cost you or the other person. Loves you enough to tell you the truth. Loves you enough to enter into where you are and to walk with you, to abide with you in the midst of the mess of your life, if that's what it takes. While Jesus ate and drank, traveled and joked, taught and laughed with the disciples, he also rebuked Peter when Peter was determined not to allow Jesus to suffer and die. Remember, in, in just the lines before, Jesus uh, you know, asked, Who am I? He says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and Jesus said, No, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, Peter. My Father in heaven revealed that to you. And then in the next breath, Jesus goes on to describe, okay, now what does that mean? And he rolls it out that he's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be there and he's going to be arrested, tried, scourged and crucified and rise on the third day. And Peter takes him by the arm and drags him off by himself a little by a heart and says, God forbid that you should do that. And Jesus looks over his shoulder and he sees the other disciples. And what does he say to Peter? Peter, get behind me. You're not speaking like God would speak, but like a man. So in one moment, he praises him because he gets it right. And here's the thing. If you look in the Scriptures, the only one who has the right to rebuke anything is God. Peter put himself in the Father's place. And so Jesus put him in his place. He did it in love. It was important to do. He got it right, he got it wrong, he got rebuked for it, and they moved on. Think of that. But Jesus wasn't done. He rebuked Peter again. When at the Last Supper, Peter wouldn't allow Jesus to act as a servant and wash his feet. 
And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. He said, oh, you know, Peter, then wash my head and my, my, my whole body. He says, no, you don't need a full body wash. You came in here, you walked in the dirt, you got your feet dirty, you're already clean from the ankles down, so if I wash your feet, you're totally clean. You're good to go. Don't you understand? You had a bit of that of the that this is a, a model of how I am a servant. Nobody washed anybody else's feet. Even a slave did not have to wash the master's feet. You washed your own feet. So Jesus, who is our master, washes their feet by telling them, if I'm your master, I do this for you, I expect you to do this kind of service, no matter what it takes, for your brothers and sisters. No one is so low that you can't be low with them and take care of them. That was the point. When the disciples feared for their lives as they were caught up in the storm on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus regrouped the storm and questioned their faith. Like, why didn't you do this? Why did I have to get up from my nap and, and calm the storm? And they were bewildered, didn't understand. When Philip asked Jesus to show them the Father and they would be satisfied, Jesus looked Philip in the eye and said, Do you not know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Following the resurrection, after all the disciples had deserted him, Jesus returned to them not with condemnation, but with his peace and with a mission. Please note, Jesus' purpose for having spoken all these things to his disciples is that their joy. I mean, who would have guessed that would be the next line? After all of this, he speaks this to them so that their joy may be complete or full or perfect. And that joy Jesus might be in them made perfect. And that their joy and hence our joy might also be complete in Him. And Jesus' purpose in appointing us is so we will bear fruit that remains, especially in the craziness of this present world. And so whatever we ask of the Father in Jesus' name, He will give us so that we may accomplish His purpose for our lives, your life, your particular individual life, and our corporate life as the body of Christ, the ecclesia, in this place of time. That all people might come to know who Jesus is. And some of the things we might ask for might be something like this. Things like strength to continue loving people self-sacrificially. Courage to stand as a, as a watchman on the wall, willing to speak the truth about Jesus, sin and redemption, to a world in love with falsehood and in love with many gods. Grace to forgive ourselves and others as we have been forgiven by God. Mercy in dealing with the unjust, the annoying and the unkind among us. Compassion to continue caring when we are tired of caring and would just as soon someone else do what needs to be done. I don't know if you have ever felt like that. <laughs> but you can pray for compassion. Gentleness to restore the brokenhearted and those who are lost. Patience when we long for a quick fix and a speedy resolution to suffering and for kindness to withstand the onslaught of anger poured out by the world upon us and upon those who are marked with the sign of the cross and sealed with the Holy Spirit unto the day of salvation. As one person has rightly noted, being a Christian is not for sissies. And so, beloved, because I know that you are not sissies, but full of the power of the Holy Spirit, and we abide in Jesus, and He abides in us, what do we do? We pick up our cross, and we follow Him. That is what we do.
be bright and salutary, that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who after his resurrection appeared openly to his disciples, in their sight was taken up from heaven and earth, that given to us to make partakers of his divine nature, we should with the church on earth and the host of heaven praise and give glory and honor to you forever, your or people. And so rejoice with all the churches of heaven and on earth, all the saints, all the blessed you have taken home to be with yourself, that we may bond with them eternally. Bless us, keep us prosperous, prosperous Heavenly Father, that we may give praise and honor to your name.
blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in His grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive Him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to His through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.